person drop out. Did you see that, <laughs> that request? That's too scared. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. You're also going to have to tell us. Oh, wait. Okay. Someone's actually here. Cool. We have it. Christy from Los Angeles. Great. Um, I guess to encourage people, let's all say where we're calling from. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm calling in from London. What time is it there? Uh, 10 p.m. Oh, which is fun. I'm in New York mm -hmm. City. I'm in Montreal. Alex. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm. Uh, Gee, Alex, you don't know where you are, do you? She's in a locker room. Sorry, I'm hearing She's this like several times. Sorry, I was setting up the stream, so I just heard the conversation three times in three different windows. Oh. <laughs> so my timing is all off. I'm in Toronto. Cool. Got there eventually. <laughs> well, we could just start introducing the thing and then people will filter in okay. yes okay well so this is our um fifth session of lockdown film school um and we're really excited for this i mean we're excited for all the sessions but we're really <laughs> excited for this one because we're big fans of both of our guests um madeline olnick and annie mond oh shoot did your name get written up wrong that's my fault <laughs> um so um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so um, we have quite a history with both of these filmmakers. Um, I first discovered um, Anne's films with uh, her second feature, Our Loved Ones, which I saw at TIFF, and I absolutely fell in love with it and got to interview her about the film and was just so excited about her work and have been following it excitedly ever since. Um, <laughs> And it's been very exciting this week because I, I made everybody at Seven Throw watch all of her films so we could do a podcast on them, which will be dropping on Tuesday. So that will be a great follow up to this discussion. And now Orla first discovered um, Wild Nights with Emily at the Edinburgh Film Festival in 2018. And she's been a huge advocate for it. And she has made all of us watch it and follow up with it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually both of those films appeared on our best films of the decade list. So. Oh. Um, anyways, we're very excited oh. about this. Oh. About this film of the decade. Um, and so I'll just tell you a little bit about our guests. Um, Madeline Olnick is a New York City based playwright and filmmaker. Her third feature, Wild Nights with Emily, was funded by a Guggenheim Fellowship, premiered at South by Southwest, and is a comedy drama about Emily Dickinson. And Olnick has also directed the Foxy Merkins and codependent lesbian space alien seeks same, both of which uh, premiered at Sundance. Um, Anne Mond is a Montreal based screenwriter and director. Her third feature, Nelly, was freely adapted from the life and work of Quebecois writer Nelly Arcan. Amon has also written and directed the features Nuit Numero Un, Our Loved Ones, and Jeune Juliette. I don't know why some of those are in French and some of them are English. They're all in <laughs> French. <laughs> um, her first three films were selected for um, Canada's Top Ten, and she's received multiple nominations at the Canadian Screen Awards, most recently for the screenplay for Jeune Juliette. Um, and uh, I guess one of the reasons we wanted to bring these two uh, filmmakers together uh, for this discussion is because they both have recently made a film that was a portrait of an artist. And that's something that we've been thinking about a lot at Seventh Row. We've written in the last year, we wrote two books on films that were about um, female artists. One was on Joanna Hogg's The Souvenir and one was on Celine Siama's uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, and, um, Anne and Madeline have both done pretty unconventional biopics of uh, Nelly Arcan and uh, Emily Dickinson. And so we thought it would be really wonderful to bring them together to discuss, you know, those, those, those two films in particular, but their work as a whole and their process in general. So, um, Orla, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Cool. Um, so basically we're going to have about 40 minutes of me facilitating a discussion between the two of you and then at the end, uh, we're gonna turn it over to the audience. So throughout this whole discussion, you can use the feature at the bottom of the screen, the Q&A feature. If you have any questions, 
just type them in there and then we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to ask a very, very broad question of how did you become a filmmaker? What was your journey to doing this? Who talks first? <laughs> you do. They're always, do. always the person who speaks French. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I've, uh, I think I've always been like a child with a lot of imagination. I loved to be alone. I loved to read. I loved, but um, I uh, didn't know what I would do like later. But I have always been like an artistic uh, mind, I would say. Uh, and um, when I was 15 years old, I watched uh, Train Spotting. And it, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, a, I was a teenager. I was red uh, hair and everything. And so it, it's a very rebel film. And I come from a very, very small town where um, you cannot watch anything else but uh, blockbusters films. So Trainspotting would be my first like uh, encounter with uh, different uh, movies so from there i just decided that i would do films so it was like a straight line i went to school and i did short films and i did films and um, until now precisely this year i never doubt uh, about what i would do with my life well mm. professionally <laughs> yeah So you're doubting what you're going to do with your life? Right now, yes. For the first time, I'm, think I'm thinking about doing something else, maybe. Yeah. What else? A farm. A farm? Ooh. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, so I A might farm? invite you. <laughs> what? Uh, what? A farm? A farm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care of uh, plants and animals. <laughs> yeah. OK. But, uh, maybe um, it's a COVID-19. Uh, oh, I see. <laughs> I see. You wish you had a farm that you were living on, or yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You want to run a farm? Yeah, a small one. Like, oh, okay, good. Small, small, small. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you ran your farm, are you going to be making films as well? I don't know. Much more, much less. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Anyway. Well, you you should make a film. Make a film about your farm. About the farm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Um. I. My background was in theater and I started out when I was in high school wanting to be an actor. And I remember once when I looked through this window into this backstage area of our high school and I saw this rehearsal going on and I saw this girl who was in the school who was normally very kind of snotty act being like it was they were doing Dickens a Christmas Carol and she was greeting guests and I was just blown away how someone could be so transformed and mm -hmm. it was almost like it was literally like a moment where it was like I was literally struck like I was like I have to do this I really I really wanted to be an actor and I went to NYU and I trained in the acting program but even when I was there, I was finding that I was more pulled to be outside of it, wanting to direct and write. So I did theater for years and did plays that I put up in downtown New York. And then I felt like at a certain point, film became the storytelling medium of urgency it became the medium that people could get something together really quickly. It was like film and theater traded places, like theater got all this money for developing things. So you'd have a play and it would be in development in all these different theaters. And film became the medium of let's do this right now, like there's something urgent we have to make. So I realized I was in the wrong medium. So my interest was a storytelling interest. Um, so I changed from, in how old was I? I was old. I was in my late 30s and I changed to film from theater. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn film and it was hard because I didn't have a photography background or any kind of like visual. 
I was a dialogue-based playwright. Um, so that's how I ended up as a filmmaker. But when I, I do remember when I was younger and I saw the movie Stranger Than Paradise, Jim Jarmusch movie, and that mm. was the first time I'd ever seen a movie that had that kind of sensibility on screen. And I thought, oh, I didn't know a movie could be like that. I was seeing that same sensibility that was in downtown theater in New York. And mm. I had never seen it in a film before. So then I, I remember thinking like, oh, that, that seems interesting. Um, I could do what I do in theater, but I could do it in film. Mm. Um, and I guess Was to- that, Is that, Anne, did you understand all that? Yes, okay. thank you for speaking, <laughs> walking slowly. That's <laughs> I do talk slowly anyway, so. I... Okay, <laughs> everything, thank you. Um, I, I guess to, to talk about the the two films that are portraits of artists, Nelly and Wild Right, Natural Writers, Nelly. writers. Specifically. Yeah, specifically yeah. writers. Um, they're, I mean, in a way, they're both, they're both biopics of real people. And I feel like that word is a bit tainted um, because often biopics could be kind of, are considered boring. Um, so I was wondering how you both approached the biopic genre in a way that ensured it wasn't stale or regressive. Well, um, first of all, in fact, uh, I, I know biopic have bad reputation, but I love them usually. Um, mm. Anyway, even like cheesy, bad biopic, if it's an interesting character, I'm interested. So uh, that, that was my first uh, um, main idea. I was like, I don't care, I won't. And I, I, I think the first thing, my first, um, like uh, idea was not to position myself uh, like it was to position myself um, between me and the character, not between me and the biopic. I, I, like to me, it was not important. It's a biopic, how to treat a biopic. I didn't really think about it. And I end up with something unconventional, but to this day, uh, I'm still not sure it was the best decision, you know, maybe a, a very conventional biopic would have been like uh, uh, as interesting as, as it is, uh, as uh, uh, inter more interesting, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, yeah, so my first idea was just to listen to this character, to Nelly Arcan, and, um, and try to uh, maybe try not to, uh, to, uh, tell her life, but to tell like her, unfortunately, pain, because I think it's been a very painful life. And uh, that that was the, I, I, I wanted more of a feeling than a story, I think. Hmm. That's, I saw the movie last night, I really enjoyed it. It was, I thought it was amazing, so. I, I watched your film this morning, I think oh. it, we, we can talk about it later, but it's so great. Such a great film. I, I agree. I love biopics too. I know they are considered the kiss of death in filmmaking. Um, I always love biopics just because even the worst one <laughs> usually has one little piece of information about that artist's life that is interesting or inspirational or um, so generative and helpful. I I had one th I had a couple of thoughts going in with this movie which was I I felt often with writers biopics you don't get to sit inside their language so much especially poetry biopics it tends to be like a shot of the ocean and some line we hear some lines of the poem um, so I wanted to try to create an experience where you got to sit inside of Emily Dickinson's poems because they're, they're so modern. That's what was so shocking to me about her poetry 
from the image that were fed about her, you would never imagine that the, these were the poems she wrote. And that image of her actually makes you not want to read her poems, <laughs> which I didn't. I was always like, she's just described so creepy. I had no interest in reading her work. And so I wanted to give people the experience of being inside the poems. And I also wanted people to understand how the poems came out of moments or things she had experienced, not necessarily in a linear fashion in her life. Mm -hmm. So I took events of her, the real events of her life, even though a lot of them are things that people didn't know, like a lot of people believed that Emily Dickinson didn't want to be published in her lifetime, which makes her just batshit insane. Like no one writes that many poems if you don't want to be published. Um, so I wanted to show I from her life and work so many of her ideas, what she experienced came out of. So I was trying to make it a holistic experience instead of weeding the work out of her lived life. Mm. Yeah. I mean, since you both really like biopics, do you have like favorite examples? Uh, to me, uh, there's two of them. There is uh, The Hours. I, I oh yeah, awesome. I biopic and I think it's, it's yes. very, very great. And uh, probably the, the film about uh, Bob Dylan. Um, mm. Sorry, I can't remember the title right now. I'm not. Sorry. I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not there. there. <laughs> yeah. That would be um, my new, uh, favorite biopic of the, yeah, of the last year for, for yeah, that's the one of on top of my mind. Yeah, hmm. I I love the hours also because by through having that the structure of the three women, you were able to see what her work meant to a future reader. So, and I also felt that there wasn't, there had, hadn't ever been a movie that captured the process of writing like The Hours did because it showed us that, there's that scene where um, Nicole Kidman's walking around, she's like on this, in this park or something and she's confused okay. she's trying to figure out. And it's like, that's just what it's like. And her sister has that line, uh, your aunt is lucky, she has two lives. There's the life she's living and then the book she's writing. And, but her also being, being, wanting, wishing she had her sister's life with the party and the family, you know, and the kids and everything, that part. And that was the other, and that other moment that was really devastating in your movie or just perfectly captured was when the, writer character finds out that her friend's pregnant yeah and the look on her face like i've i've had a moment like that where it's like your last friend who didn't have kids <laughs> is leaving you and you're like you're definitely alone in this thing now let's talk about that <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that yeah wait but do you know what i mean like that i know what you that. mean and yeah. everything that you captured on her face, like just the pitch of it, just everything that was unstated, but that we un understood, mm -hmm. um, having her register that it was, it was amazing. So, um, yeah, so, so the hours, and then there was this really weird film. I think the film was called Stevie. It was about that, po she's an English poet. She wrote the poem, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. Mm -hmm. And mm. Glenda Jackson played her in this really weird movie that you can only watch in pieces on YouTube. It's like in 21 pieces, <laughs> you can watch this movie. Um, and when I, at the, I got the Guggenheim, the Guggenheim didn't fund the entire film. It was, uh, so we do advertise it a lot because we wanted people to understand that actual research went into this movie and a legit, legitimate scholarly organization was backing it because no one had told this story of Emily Dickinson. And when we were first premiering at South by Southwest, a lot of people thought I had made it up. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But um, the head of the Guggenheim came up to me and was like, you should watch that movie, Stevie. Like, and I was like, oh, what was that? Uh, I'd never heard of it. It's really amazing. I think it's called Stevie, but it stars Glenda Jackson. She's amazing. And it's about this poet. Mm. Name, I believe, was Stevie. And I believe Stevie was the name of the movie, but who wrote the poem, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think in making biopics about people who aren't with us anymore, it must be like, How do you navigate the line between depicting things that you know happened and then sort of creating scenes based vaguely on your research? Because, I mean, Anne, in your film, you mix the fiction with the reality as well. Um, How do you, yeah, how do you navigate that line? It must be kind of ethically interesting. And was yours were the stories of those novels, right? Well, it was, it was part of her life, uh, yeah. part of the of the research I did, part of my imagination, and part of uh, her books. And uh, I think we, you and me, had um, like very different uh, jobs because mine was uh, like she's a modern woman. She just died, in fact, almost when we did the film. Wow. So it was very delicate because she. Right. I've met her parents, her boyfriend, her clients, uh, even because she was a prostitute. And I met clients of her. I've met like a lot of people who were still alive, who were waiting for the film to recognize her. Uh, At some point, I had the feeling that they 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 missed her. Um, Of course, they missed her, but they wanted to see her again in the film. So it was kind of a uh, huge, huge pressure, but different than yours. Yours was a very huge pressure because it's it's like a, a well-known internationally artist. So it's yes. just different, d- different. Um, to me, I I think I just um, I uh, I in fact I assumed that it would be kind of a lie anyway so i think at the when you when you make a film you lie all the time <laughs> that's when you make art you lie you you never tell all the truth in a two hours film it's just not possible and uh, more than that in fact you conscien- consciously consen- consciously lie i think so i I chose that, like I, I was, and I think I played with that in the film also. At some at some point, you don't know if it's true, if it's from the movie, if uh, from her books, right. uh, from the screenwriter. So um, she plays different characters, and I I think even if it's a lie, at some point uh, the the feeling of uh, chaos is true. I, I know if it mm. makes sense. I think that there's a lot of lies in the film. I uh, I wrote a lot of scenes. I'm not sure everything happened, but um, at some point I made an idea of this woman that I've never met, and um, and it's crazy because I was watching your film this morning and I was amazed how your Emily Dickinson is more free and more mo- modern than my Nelly. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. It's crazy, because <laughs> uh, I was jealous. At, I was like, wow, she, it's great that she's so free and the film is joyful and everything. And 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 the, my that's why I think my, my film after Nelly is um, much more joyful and it's about a young girl who never who never uh, feels sorry, you know, because Nelly was a, a shame, like a shame mm. of herself and her mm. um, behavior. Mm. And it was in all her books and everything. So what, what I was watching your Emily Dickinson, I was like, huh, maybe it's not completely true. Like, w- was it that free? Right, right. Well, but actually- I didn't care, you know, because I was happy to discover <laughs> this. You know, you so know that- that's a good point you bring up yeah. because there, I've, Obviously, there there were some expressions of shame uh, that she wrote when she was first, when she was a teenager and she was first having these feelings. And because the movie was the overview of her whole life and because it was also the story of the woman who 
was her brother's mistress who put together the myth of Emily Dickinson that we all know today, that other story we all know of Emily Dickinson being this kind of crazy, half-cracked recluse who never left her room. Um, there wasn't, I, I assume that people know, there wasn't time, I didn't have time to sort of give the shame its moment. Like I felt like people would infer it. They've seen, everyone has seen so many coming out movies and they've seen so much gay shame on screen that I thought, you know what, I... Oh yeah, no, but uh, we didn't need it. Yeah, we, I figured <laughs> I like... The, the, strength, the strength of the film. That yeah, she... yeah, and moments where she's sitting, like there's a moment where she's seeing or she's writing the poem and her, her uh, beloved is marrying her brother. <laughs> like she's quiet, like we understand their stuff that she's struggling mm -hmm. with. So it is true, it, it's, I, just, I made a decision that I, I thought like, okay, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't, it seemed like a beat people would infer and I felt like the story that hadn't been told was of the great joy that she had in her life. And so I needed to give people the arc of that experience. But it was, with like what you're saying, it was really hard. I had a lot of struggles with, when you make a movie, you have to change, you know, you have to dramatize things in order to give people the experience of someone's life. You can't do literally every single thing that happened or the movie would be as long as that person's life. Like you have to combine events, you have to, you know, get at the essence of things. And it was hard because I had to make my movie work, but I had to also base it in these actual events. I had to have reality in it because, um, because I knew the movie would be skewered otherwise. Like I knew if there were things that I took dramatic liberties with, all the people who were, who were um, not wanting to believe this about Emily Dickinson would poke their fingers at these other things. So, I, so it was actually really hard to try to include actual events and names and dates and all those kinds of things that I had to include and still make it work flow dramatically it that was really a challenge but it was the it was um the task it was something i had to do i mean it's i know with apples dickinson it's like we understand we're not supposed to take any of that literally like we understand there's a talking bee and there's a you know a rapper in a carriage like we they signal to the audience that you're not supposed to take this literally and they just do every, anything they want you know but no one had told this story before I had told it, and I needed to, it needed to be grounded in her actual life rather than me just making stuff up as I wanted to. Um, mm. So it was hard. It was, it was a challenge because of that, because I felt like I didn't have as much freedom as I wanted to. Um, I had an obligation to get it right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Alex and I have been thinking a lot recently about how there is there has been sort of an uptick in films about female artists I mean even just looking at Emily Dickinson we had no movies about her and now we have several um and mine I'm, is the best yes yours is the best thank you um Most and um <laughs> this is. is the only one that appears in the seventh row best of the decade list. <gasps> yeah, um that proves it that proves it um <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why you sort of think this is a contemporary fascination and how you approached it. And also, I guess I'm particularly interested, Madeline, that I, I saw that this was like a play back yes. in 1999 that you wrote. So yeah. how like things have changed since then? Not being... really. Well, <laughs> yeah, they have talk a about that. Bit. Yeah, they have talked about that. Bit. The difference for me when I was younger and wrote the play I was really moved by the love story between the two women and outraged that this was something that people didn't know about, that it had been taken from history. 
Um, but when I wrote the screenplay, and there was, there, again, as time goes on, like more information is revealed about Emily Dickinson, and I was as, um, as struck by the story of her struggles as a writer, that she went and literally put stuff in the mail, courted famous editors and uh, publishers, like really tried to get her voice out there. And at that time, you know, with what was expected of women when women didn't have the right to vote, for her to be, to her to have pursued that in the way that she did as the daughter of the most important family in that town, like it was what she, it was considered, you know, improper, like women weren't supposed to be writers. So for her to, it was, she was really on an edge to be chasing that and to want to be taken seriously as an artist and to, to take the time to work so hard on her poems. So I was as um, the difference in the, the play, I mean, aside from you have to make a play into a movie and the play version had tons more letters. Um, the play version also had a lot more of the, of Emily and Susan when they were young women, like many, many more scenes. Um, so um, the, the movie version, even though it had less letters and poems, you had more of an experience of them, of those poems. So you, so you remembered them more and it also really had more about her trying to get published. So that was the difference. I, and that was, was, and also there was stuff like, that was the beginning of identity politics. I was, it was during the AIDS crisis and I was a member of ACT UP and it was, I, there was this really funny scene we had. It was one of the last things that we cut where the scene where Emily and young Emily and Susan are first kissing and touching each other and and um, and we had a modern day lecture give a this lecture about how um, Emily Dickinson, you know, it was about how and identity politics didn't exist. It was like this sort of academic um, lecture about how you could never say this was true of Emily Dickinson because now I'm like blanking on what happened, but it was in the movie, we shot it, like we had, she goes, Emily goes, Susan goes to kiss her, she undoes her belt buckle, and then there was a hard cut to like this panel, this table in modern day, and this person saying, you know, and our website lists all of her gingerbread recipes. And then like a discussion, you know, a vague discussion about identity politics. And um, and the young, when I showed it to young people, they thought I meant that. Like it was something I was making fun of, but now they were like, oh wait, like they thought it was a, it was a message I was giving or something, but it was the last, there were a whole bunch of scenes in, in the present day. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the last one to go. So the the play version had like tours, modern day tours, looping through the house of people getting you know this lecture on what the Emily Dickinson's life was like. And since the Dickinson Museum wasn't framing her like that anymore, I also didn't want to misrepresent the Dickinson Museum because when I was doing the play, the um, the Emily Dickinson Museum used to take you into the the tour guide would take you into this room that had all these pictures of men on the wall and be like who was emily dickinson's secret lover was it this guy was it this guy you know so um some of that stuff which had shifted like five or seven years ago um once the new museum had took over i didn't also didn't feel like i conclude that that was the longest answer now I'm, i don't want to talk for the rest of the interview just Anne and talk <laughs> I mean, Anne, can you speak to like what feels like an increased interest in stories about female artists and how you chose to kind of depict Nellie's writing process? Uh, I'm sorry, what is the first part of the question? The um, 
just the there seems to be sort of a a recent interest in films about female artists and I don't know could you speak to that why yeah. do you think that is and what drew you to to telling her story as an artist uh well I I think the well to me the answer is very simple and almost uh, mathematic like woman makes more film uh, these days so <laughs> It's like, it's, I, th I think it would be like the basic answer answer mm. we we make films so of course mm. we can well I, I I'm uh, I'm not stupid I know like uh, men can make great films about women also like uh, it's it's not what I say but uh, the fact that we make more films yes. is uh, it's right. like a simple yeah. formula we yeah. are interested by like women stories more and more um, and um, but I feel it's quite rec recent um, this, this uh, thing that women make more film which is great but when I uh, when I start uh, writing on Nelly it was in the, we shot the film in 2015 and I'm almost under the impression it's another world, like f five years uh, later. So, uh, in in a way, I think if um, if Nelly would go out uh, today or last year, it would be understood much more as a feminist film that it's been understood like five years ago. So it's uh, to to me it's crazy how the world uh, changed. I don't say it's uh, the change is over, but uh, it changed fast, and um, and I I think it's it's great. And uh, when I when I was when I start working on uh, on Nelly, um, I I didn't. Uh, what happened exactly? I, I I don't know. I was interested by this woman for like the 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 day I've read all of her book and the day. I learned about her suicide. I I wrote notes on my computer. Like I, I I knew at some point I would make a film about her because, in fact, she was to me Nelly Arcan, but she was also uh, Sylvia Plath, Virginia Woolf, Amy Winehouse. She she was like a lot of women that I uh, admired, uh, and that also I was. Um, sad for and I, uh, I and in fact uh, it was maybe um, angriness, angriness can you say that I was I was angry so I don't know that that's how it started maybe it's not a good um, feeling to start a film <laughs> but that's what I felt I was angry and I wanted to uh, to uh, share something to not be alone with this um, this angriness anymore so that's how it started Mm. And, and I don't know this woman. She Nelly. She and th that's why I that's why I loved your film so much. She Nelly hated herself like uh, so much for all her life and uh, how she everything she did. So and and that's uh, I think it's very good in your film that she she doesn't feel sorry and she doesn't hate herself and it's so great. And and I'm still thinking sometimes oh maybe if I redo Nelly five years later maybe the portrait the portrait would be different which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is positive I think yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah I made a film about a woman who's uh, sorry to exist who's yeah and um, and and I think it was true and I, th I think when you read the book that's what you feel um, but well, I think that she, um, that scene where that reporter comes and it was like she hadn't even been thinking, oh, I should worry about how this book is going to do compared to the other one. And he yes. keeps putting it on her. And it was almost like she struck me as just someone who was very sensitive. And so she was very vulnerable to that. But that same sensitivity was what made her such a great writer. Yeah. So it was interesting, and I loved that that guy, you had him in those two scenes, and he does that again. Like, and it was, to me, it was, it worked so well having him mm -hmm. 
in those two scenes do that. Um, and it's true, it's, it's like she, or where that scene was where she was like, the critics hate me, and, they'll, and the, her publishers are like, no, they hate, it's the books, not you. Mm -hmm. you and, um, yeah. But her not being able to distinguish that. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't read it so much as like she hated herself, but she was so sensitive she couldn't manage these things. Yeah. She, yeah. she couldn't not be affected by it. Yeah. Mm. And um, and that, that's why Emily Dickinson is so inspirational to me. Like uh, five years later, she she doesn't uh, get depressed. Well, well, she probably did in, in real life, of course. But I think the, um, the movie is positive. And as I said, I think movie is, an, is a lie and you can choose which lie right, you right. Have, it's true. in a way. Yeah, yeah. So, it's uh, true. Yeah. But I think that if you're, because she wrote nearly 2,000 poems and you can't be that prolific Writing itself is an act of hope. You know, it's you make this investment because even if you write something that's very despairing, it's a hopeful act to do that. So I considered that in that she had a belief, she did have a belief that it was worthwhile to do it. And that was a positive thing. That if mm. she was as crazy and depressed or whatever, as people said, and didn't want to publish, she wouldn't have written so much. But that it, that that kind of life in itself is is a positive is a positive journey in in that because there's sustenance in the in the poems themselves for her. So even if the outside world didn't give it to her, there's enough richness that she experienced when she was imagining them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted, before I pass over to the audience, um, I wanted to ask a bit about both of your editorial processes, because I feel like the editing of your films are really special in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like Madeline in your films, they're very funny and editing is crucial to creating that comedic timing. And Wild Nights with Emily especially cuts between so many different things. And the same is true for Nelly. You're balancing um, different timelines, different versions of her. And in all of your films, I feel like you play with the passage of time. Um, so yeah, generally, how do you approach the editing process? And how do you think about the editing in your films? You speak? I speak. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I um, I I in first I'm there a lot. Like I uh, I I don't edit myself my films. I work with uh, an editor. I have two uh, guys that I work with uh, that I love a lot, like a lot. Uh, I am there like from beginning to end. Sometimes I'm I'm going out of the editing room a little bit. Um, earlier than them because I get crazy and I'm like, OK, I need to, to go home and do something else. But um, um, I would say it's to me, it's uh, painful, to be honest. Uh, I love writing films and I love shooting films, but uh, editing is uh, is very tough because it's like it's the truth and it's in your face. And uh, I find it painful, to be honest. Um, I. I don't know how to say that. In fact, it's like I'm. Um, <laughs> it's it's a nightmare, and you try to uh, get out of the nightmare. That, that's the that's how I feel. Like it's a long, painful experience. And uh, and uh, when I when I find good things uh, at night at my place, I'm not sure anymore they were good finally. So it's like a, it's a chaotic experience to be honest. And I get like very like I don't sleep a lot, and I get very. Um, um, I live in the film, to be honest. I, I know I sound crazy, and maybe that's why I want a farm right now, like to, <laughs> to change. But, uh, I, I am very in intense in the, the editing process, and I don't. I'm I'm not under the 
when it's finished yeah. it's finished because the producers tell me it's finished so <laughs> uh, so i i'm uh, i'm not really at peace with the film with in, any of my films in fact it's 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 my process i like i work 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 as long as i can and i invite uh, good friends to see the films and um, and it's an art process so i don't i wish i could like answer creatively how it works but i just say it's a nightmare i try to <laughs> take images, music and like i put everything there and i pray and that's how it works for me <laughs> yeah i second the nightmare <laughs> it's a nightmare it's it's um my editing process goes on forever it shocks people um I reduce most of my editors to tears at some point, not by speaking meanly to them, but just by making us redo things over and over. And I have screenings where I try to, I assemble screenings where I try to assemble a group of people who I've never met in my life, um, who don't know anything about the film. And we watch it I'm really interested in especially their reaction like as the movie's playing rather less so than what they say after but you can feel it in the room when you have everyone versus you don't um so one of the actors I work with her girlfriend is a publicist and she has lots of email lists so she rounds up these people I call them the rant the randoms <laughs> to like sends people over. We usually feed them. Um, so there's that lure. And so all these weird people come over. Um, <laughs> and so, and that, and I have many screens with, with and, and Wild Nights with Emily is my least funny movie. <laughs> um, I mean, it's intentionally a mix of drama and comedy, but especially with, with anything that you want to have comic moments with it is very important that you're screening it constantly in front of potential people you know who come in and really seeing like there's no faking a laugh there's no faking if something's funny lots of times in discussions people can convince each other of things but I'm really really interested in that moment when it plays like what I'm feeling do are people with it um, but it is, and actually, I, I don't even know if I should say this, but I had, I had one of the Emily editors live with me, <laughs> and what was probably like the worst decision of my entire life, <laughs> where I was like, we're gonna get this done so fast. I was like, this editing process is gonna, we're gonna get, it. like, I just thought, like, oh, we're, this is gonna, I'm gonna cut my editing time in half. Because I, I noticed that there are like for editors or yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> so it's sort of sequential, you know what I mean? Whereas, okay. but but with, we, there's so much footage we collect and it's really hard and it's, you know, I'm doing low budget work too. So it's not enough, like there's not really like our true editor's salary. So it has to be like that. And other people take other paying work and they have to leave and that's just how it is. So, um, but it's it's a very it's a very important part of the process and it was very hard emily was very it was very hard um because of the burden on it to get it right like we had to do justice to this so yeah. mm. um i'll pass on to alex now for audience questions Anyone feel free to keep writing questions down in the Q&A box. So um, from Christy, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have, how do you approach choosing a topic, theme or subject when writing screenplays? Do you just roll with what inspires you or do you also consider a target audience or maybe both? Um, I should maybe think about a target audience, but I don't. Uh, it's quite like, um, some things hit me and I want to write about it. Uh, and so even to be honest, I don't know exactly, uh, until when 
even now I don't know who's the audience for my films. So uh, I, I don't think about that. I should maybe think about that a little bit more. Uh, in my With my last film, I experienced that because uh, I really thought it was for uh, adults. And finally, a lot of <laughs> uh, people uh, programmed the film for teenagers. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, that's great because I, I I love teenagers, but to me, it's it's like a film that I, as a, as a 38 years old woman, I think it's great, you know, for my age. So uh, maybe like I, there there can be misunderstanding, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I I don't really think about audience. I really subjects come to me or emotions come to me, and uh, and then I get into the um, the, the fun of writing and the, the nightmare of editing and everything. So it, yeah, the, the film just takes me in a way. Yeah, it's it's def it's so hard to write or to make anything that unless you're really struck by something. At, at that that being said, you have to write every day or be continuously working in order for those ideas to come to you. But I don't think, what would certain people like? Because that already removes me. Um, it's too, it would be too a sort of a manipulative of a process, because then I would have to figure, oh, they like this. But then what would they like? <laughs> you know, I don't know if I could maintain that. Um, but for my two of my features had been plays previously. My first feature, Codependent Lesbian, Space Alien Seek Same, um, had also been a play. It was done at the same theater in New York, this women's theater. And it was something that I was really struck by. It was this, I, this premise came up in a writing and I really was struck by it and it's because you have to write for a long time to finish a script, so you really better be invested in and care about the story you're telling, or you're you're just not going to be able to get to the end. It's too hard. And also, it's it's maybe very selfish, but uh, I'm the first uh, audience, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, I like it. They would like it because I'm right. pretty normal, you know. I'm, I'm normal person, so if I'm, yeah, I'm not a normal person, you. that's a problem. But <laughs> so if I like something, there's no guarantee that anyone else will like it. Yeah, well, well, I don't know. Yeah, you're not normal. But I am. So okay, well, that's good. That's a good thing you got going. <laughs> so okay Alex yeah um so this is sort of a big question so um Lisa asked uh she says she's interested in Anne's statement that things seem to have changed rather rapidly in the film world um and she asks and she says she knows that it's true that representation is is getting better but it's still nowhere near where it should be for women and minority populations. Um, so she's wondering if you can both speculate a bit on how you think the current chaos in the US and the world in general will change film in particular and art in general. That's a, that's a hard question, yeah. but <laughs> um, I can tell you one thing I read, which was, It's, you know, it's, it's, remember after September 11th, there were all these articles, the end of irony, there's not going to be any more irony, you know, there's, there's irony. So it's hard at these moments to know what the future is really going to be like. I did read this one article that made a lot of sense that said that LA um, will no longer be as much a center of filmmaking, other smaller cities and towns that where um, there's that or less pandemic centers. I don't know what the hell, but it seemed to seem to feel like there's going to be more now. People now that people are so used to Zoom, film the film industry won't be so LA centered in the United States. And I say that 
as someone who, like that's not, I'm not in the Hollywood world, so I'm just telling you about an article I read that you could probably find and read too. Um, so I have no idea, really. Um, it, the one thing I was excited by was for my, my first two features, there was a crew of about four people. Um, so I feel like I could make another feature and what people are going to be really worried about, the most vulnerable people, as always, on the set are going to be the actors because everyone else will be able to wear a mask, but not the actors. So I don't know. It depends how long the pandemic goes on for, and um, it depends on a lot of things. But I do know that there is a push for for more female directors in Hollywood. So, and including a lot of female directors getting opportunities in television. So, I do know that has changed, and I'm hoping that we see more diverse stories, more people of color on screen and directing, and um, people understand that our narrow vision of what we've been given so far by Hollywood is just not that, it's just not that interesting anymore because it doesn't reflect the real world, so. Yeah, and yeah, I agree with all that you say and um, I think uh, it's changing. Um, well, I said the fast because it's in my own little life, you know, but it's not, it's not changing that fast. In fact, it not, it's not fast enough. And sometimes I see how what's happening in the United States right now and what's happening in, in the world uh, with the pandemic. It's another subject, but I'm thinking, wow, it will sound depressing, but I wish that we'll have time to reach equality, like of visions uh, before we don't make film anymore. I don't know if it makes sense because I'm like, when, when you see the states of the planet and how the, all the challenge that we face right now, I wish that we just have at least 25 years of movie and TV with uh, black people, women, uh, trans, and I just wish we reach real equality before uh, the end of the world. That, that sometimes I'm... That's how worried I am. But we are going through a strange um, period, but uh, I well, I hope something positive will uh, come out of this. Yeah, everyone will move to Canada. Well, <laughs> <you're welcome. laughs> that would be positive. Yeah, for all of us, it would be. For I mean, for us here in the United States. So, are, are either of you working on anything at the moment? Besides planning a farm. I am. Yes, I'm writing a, a romantic uh, comedy between, oh. uh, between two, uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, ecological anxious person, like person. Neurotic? What? <laughs> like no, Neurotic? environmental. Yeah, 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 environmental anxious, oh. but like uh, too anxious well maybe not too anxious but like uh, dysfunctional anxious oh and i'm right i'm in the writing phase of something i can't yeah. don't won't talk yet about it but <laughs> sure is hard to write sure it's hard to write writing's really hard is i it, hope everyone part of me is it a biopic um no it's not a biopic okay. it's not a biopic um, but it is, it's writing is very hard and it's hard to, with everything going on in the world, it's a challenge right now to remember that you can just, you can let the world in rather than shutting it out, I guess, but it's hard. I mean, I live on 14th street in Manhattan and, um, a lot of the stores on my block have been conveniently looted, <laughs> including if you saw that picture in the New York Times of the Urban Outfitters, that's my corner where it was just like cleaned out that whole and the fires and like there's been helicopters outside my window till 3 a.m. And I haven't, I just haven't been able to motivate myself to put in earplugs or anything. 
<laughs> like I'm like I should turn on the sound of the ocean or something <laughs> to like shut this out but it's so it's very intense and uh you know it's just like a living nightmare right now to have Donald Trump as president it's I can't even I don't understand and it's it's hard but you know it's trying to still do you know, activist things and make phone calls and sign petitions and do things so from from home and so. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both very much for um, this discussion. It's been really wonderful and um, really illuminating. Really um, enjoyed all of your insights. Um, we will send out a follow-up email to all of you who are in our lockdown film school is to um, make sure you know where you can find all of um, Madeline's and Anne's films, which are definitely worth catching up with if you haven't already seen them. Um, and I'll just um, let you know also that on our podcast, we've been talking about both of their films. So just this past week on the Seventh Row podcast, we talked about Josephine Decker's film, Shirley, as a jumping off point to talk about films about female artists. And we oh, talked about- writers. Um, Yes. <laughs> there should be female writers. Well, we talked about artists as well. So we did talk about... Um, Next time, about don't. <laughs> <laughs> talk about writers, female writers. Um, and, <laughs> um, and then this coming Tuesday, we'll have a new episode out where we talk about um, Anne's entire filmography. Um, oh, so wow. um, that's worth tuning into on our Seventh Row podcast. Um, and we have done books on female artists, not writers yet, that's in the future. Um, so if you're interested in, in those, we have a book on Joanna Hogg's The Souvenir, which is about a filmmaker um, at thesouvenirbook.com and a book on a Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is about um, a painter. Um, and so that's at siamabook.com. Uh, and so when the, book is, the book is about the movie or it's about what's it's about it's about Sayama, it's about all her films, and then it has sort of a, a larger section at the end. I about want a book. Film. Can we make a book on me? <laughs> <laughs> well, we wrote we, we wrote books about people who have done at least four films, so Well, I've done I did three features and yeah. I've had three shorts. It, I, okay, it, your next book, please. One, one more feature. One more I had to <laughs> <laughs> You need to have four films. Is that really the rule? Yeah. Yeah. That's the rule. Right, so it's now the rule. I know I have to make another feature. Mm -hmm. I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> what if I just gave you outtake? What if I just made my fourth feature out of all the outtakes of my movies? <laughs> I have my book. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm sorry, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> I was that craven. Uh, I wrote. I wrote a question and nobody answered. Oh, what oh. Was the question? How many steps did you do during the? Oh, you know. <laughs> I actually did. Th uh, I did three thousand. <laughs> wow! Oh, great. Lucky you. Okay, that's amazing. I need I'm to up to fifteen k. Good. Wow. Yeah. Good this is like my. This is about the record for the week. So that's good. <laughs> good for you thank you thanks uh so if you tune in uh next week we'll have um two uh really wonderful canadian filmmakers with us uh philippe falado who's also a quebec filmmaker and uh mina shum and they'll be talking about um directing as well so um tune in next sunday same time same place and i just want to say my mother was canadian so oh cool. <laughs> well then <laughs> almost one of us <laughs> <laughs> Right. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Merci mille fois. Merci mille fois. See you. Bye. So nice Bye. to meet you, Anne. Thank you. Well, nice thank you, you, Orla and Alex, for putting this together. It was great. Oh, Bye. thank you. Thanks for thank joining you. us. And I look forward to my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>